The Box Seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors, Woodland Stud, New Zealand Bloodstock Standard Bread, Brecken Farms, Stonewall Stud, IRT, it's your horse and our passion, Australasian Wide Garrard's Horse and Hound, Rakiro Racing Stables, Lincoln Farms, The Clubs, Alexandra Park, Cambridge Raceway, Ashburton Trotting Club, Addington Raceway, and Harness Racing New Zealand. Hi everyone, welcome to this edition of Your Box Seat. Yes, brought to you by our stable of sponsors and it's a very important week, especially for the kids around the nation. Looking forward to Santa arriving. As I say hi to Michael Guerin in Harness Racing. He has arrived today too with huge news coming out of Hamilton. He has, Gregory. Um, look, I love kids and I think it's great they're going to have a good Christmas, but I'm more interested in adult Christmas stuff and that involves, if you're in harness racing, that confirmation coming out of Cambridge and Waikato in that region today, the Waikato Bay of Plenty region, that the race, as it will be known in Gregory, get used to that, that's going to be part of our vernacular heading forward now. The race is confirmed for April the 14th, the slot race which Harness Race in New Zealand said was going to be part of the new calendar, but it has been mightily embellished. Not going to be $500,000 as we had indications it may be. It's going to be nine hundred. dollars Yep, that's right, $900,000, a new richest race in the country, albeit with very different conditions. David Branch has got permission from the board of Waikato Bay of Plenty Harness Racing to put 150000 of their money into it, which they'll raise through their own sources, potentially sponsors Gregory. Uh, Harness Racing New Zealand has decided to put its money in other directions, which we fully respect, and slots for the race, but this will all be on the website tomorrow, Greg, will be $75,000 each with a minimum three-year buy-in. So very much Harness Racing's mini version of the Everest. There'll be people, Greg, who want to pick holes in the idea. There were people who wanted to pick holes in the Everest. I was one of them initially. Didn't think it would work. But Greg, it's a great thing for Harness Racing. Superb for the Waikato region and excellent for the racing industry in this country. The race coming on April the 14th for $900,000, Greg. All right, we'll confirm all of the details around it very shortly, but as part of that, I caught up with Gary Woodham yesterday to touch on all things Harness Racing, the recent board meeting they had, where we're sitting in terms of turnover and the like, and a Christmas message coming from, uh, try and say that quickly, Christmas message coming from the CEO as well. So let's get to Gary Woodham and then get into the finer details of the race. Stop smiling, mate. It's a great time of year, isn't it? <laughs> it's bloody brilliant. Look at that out there, mate. Yeah. Not too bad, is it? No, nice and warm. Uh, some of our great grass track and uh, Christmas-type venues are underway, and things are pretty positive. Look, I think we've just come over that little ebb. We were down a bit, and so we should have been. A lot of people have been locked down for a while. Uh, we're hearing nothing but good news around our tracks. Have a look at what just happened at Rangiura yesterday. So we open up. We whip on down to Omakau, Gen 2, and it all starts from there. And uh, good luck to all of those that can get out in the way, especially those from Auckland that have been, and Waikato that have been locked down for such a long time. If you don't have, know what to do in the summer, come on down to the south and go to race meetings. I was on SENZ the other day and I said to them, look, regardless of where you are in the country, there will be a race meeting near you and there's a reason to get involved because you've got $10,000 first fours on every race through the summer circuit period. Greg, I'm pretty wrapped with what the TAB are doing for our sport. Um, big call from them. So yesterday at Rangura and goes right through to January the 17th on our grass track and, and our grid up at Nelson and so forth. But the country summer racing series down in the South Island, one, in, one up north, but mainly the South Island, and they're putting $10,000 guaranteed first fours every race. Pretty enormous effort by them. And it, it's all about wagering for the punter and everybody trying to get some money in that back pocket. And we know those fields will be full and therefore the likelihood of jackpots, as we saw at Rangiora, um, only enhances what this code's able to turn over. Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong, we need that enhancement, I'll be honest with you. We lost nine race spinnings at the start of the season and so we haven't been able to earn any money for that. So that puts pressure on us for next year's funding. But the TAB are giving us a leg up and helping us try and get those pools bigger returns bigger and the turnover bigger and if we can do that we might make up a fair bit of what we haven't been able to get earlier on. 
It's significant, of course, because on the 1st of January, it's the first year that the new season, as it is now, and the, and the age of the horse changes. So um, that's taken a bit of getting your head around. Yeah, I've, I, even though I've been part of this for the 18, 18 weeks of consultation, I struggled. I was talking to a couple of our partners and the horses that we've got the other day, and I made a comment, oh, look, we're a bit of a bugger that we've missed most of the season with a horse, and then I was politely reminded by one of my partners, you idiot, um, we haven't really started the new season yet, and he's going to be three on January 1. So it takes a little bit, and I'm closest than anybody to it. We'll get there. We'll get there. Got some excellent racing coming up. You mentioned uh, Central Otago with Omicare, uh, the Northern Southland Cup, the Southern Lights, all of these really good races. So we actually kick off straight into the group race season. Yeah, we actually end up with the very first two weeks. So from January 1 to January 12, we have four group three races across New Zealand, three down south and one up in Waikato. So it just starts straight away, Greg. Mm. Junior drivers, the concession uh, changes have come in now, and we saw an example of that, bang, straight off, Carter, Dalgetty, yeah. Laver. Uh, there's a real encouragement there for the horse people and the owners out there uh, to utilise the juniors. And, of course, you've got the new Revel Douglas series. Yeah, so, look, the Revel Douglas one, um, I'm thrilled that we can be part of it. Um, High Gain and uh, Revel's father, Don, and co have got in behind it five years at this stage. Um, kicks off in, uh, down south in Cromwell on the 6th. I'll be there for that. Um, two races in the south, two races in the north. Um, sad, sad uh, situation, uh, but we need to remember people like that. They're part of our family, and we want to make sure that his name isn't forgotten. Yeah, he's a great man, Rev, and, and that's a year to the day, too, year to the day. kicks off. So, yeah. Um, yeah, pretty special. Now, a board meeting was held last week. Mm. Tell me, what was the feeling out of that? Look, we're, the board meeting covered a number of issues, um, how we're going as a, as a code, financials and all the rest of it, um, what we're doing uh, around that venue that we still have to uh, move on, which is round Forbury, so we had a long discussion about that. And then it was all about where, we, where we're actually going for this coming season, um, and the board are right behind all the changes. Uh, a couple more changes are coming out this week. You'll start seeing the code of conduct hit, hit the papers, if not right now while we're, we're filming. Uh, you're going to see some changes come for handicapping and you're going to see some starters changes come through. Yeah. And they were all discussed at the board Yeah, meeting. tell me a bit more about the starters. So um, the, the, there's some guidelines, if you like, as to once the horses go onto the track, what everyone needs to adhere to. Yeah, so let's put this in context too. This hasn't just been done from HRNT. This is the starters themselves with, this, with the RIB trainers and drivers associations all getting together and working out what we need to do. I think I've had most complaints in the last three months about standing starts in New Zealand and people saying get rid of them. Well, at this stage we're not, but we do have to tidy them up. And we also have to look at what we're doing from a presentation point of view in the sport. You know, people, why do they come here and what do they want to do? And, and, and the product needs to be as good as it can. So we need to tidy that up. So all of them will look at doing the starting from the same way, get everyone on a bit of paper. But the big one for trainers, drivers, is when they go on that track, they better have their gear ready, and when they do their warm-up, they better be back within three minutes tightening their whatever they need to on that horse because they must be in that sulky three minutes before the start and they won't be allowed out unless there's an accident, whatever, or the Stipe injury stewards giving them access to, to change something or the starter does. But other than that, you're in that sulky three minutes and you're not moving from it. All right, details uh, will, of course, be with all of those associations. Just back to the code of conduct and... Um, there's been a lot of industry discussion, I suppose, and you had a consultation process, so that went out and, and people had the opportunity to uh, respond to that. But this is not really heavy-handed. It's more about protecting our sport and the people in it. Well put. Um, this isn't about attacking people. If you want to have a, have a say, talk about the policy and what we do and what we do right, wrong, whatever, have an opinion, but please don't attack people. Um, I'm not into that. We don't want to have that. They're not in our sport, but we're not doing anything different than other sports do. We're just way behind. Most other sports that you know already have this in place, and it's not about muffing people or silencing people. That's not what this is about. And, and I think, Greg, we've had two rounds of consultation, and I think because of taking our time, we've got it right. The last, last lot, we only had two more changes that need to be made. We gave that to the board last week, and it's now sitting there ready to rumble. 
The other thing I wanted to talk to you about was the race, the slot race, down for the 14th of April at uh, Cambridge. Uh, there's been not a lot of noise about it, so I understand this week that David Branch and his team uh, out of the Waikato will be asking for expressions of interest, and you guys have had some discussion around the board table around this. Yep, yep, that was discussed at the board. Um, Catherine McDonald from GMA Racing and uh, Dave will be announcing something this week. Hopefully it will be Wednesday slash Thursday. Um, <clears throat> Dave has done a lot of work in trying to line up what we need to do in comparison to all these other slot races around the world. So we've, been, we've had the benefit of watching others see what works and what doesn't work. Um, we've listened to a lot of other people, uh, what they think. The $50,000 one, which was I thought was a lot of money, is a surprise to me that they'd like it to be more that they have to put in. So watch for that. Uh, it will be more. Uh, they're still working on the exact figure, and but that will come out this week. And um, I'd have to say I wasn't sure about it all, Greg, because I don't know enough about the slot racing. So I've learned a lot along the way. And what's interesting to me is understanding is it's not necessarily the owners that buy these slots, by the way. It's companies like Coca-Cola or Tab Corp or Labrooks in Australia, and they buy them, and then they work with the owners and trainers to put the best horse, and they use it as a marketing sponsorship type thing, and that can only be good for our, our sport if we want people to buy those slots and then work with the trainers and owners on which horses run, and they're out there helping us promote our sport. How? What a great thing. Yeah, how so good. that's what a slot race really does, yep. and it's not using any of our sport's money because it's funded by those that buy the slots. All right, and those that buy the slots, you're looking at a longer commitment than just one year. Yeah, we want to sign them up for three. One thing that David learnt in, in his um, review was if you, if you do it for three, you get that commitment and we can work with those people over that period and, and refine it to the best it can possibly be. Whereas one, you know, if it, it just it don't, you don't give yourself time to actually give the right review. The second part of that is the amount of people that have already rung up David and Catherine of interest. And the next point was, well, when are you going to do it for trotters? So let's have a look at, we'll do what, one year, we'll still review it, we'll do one year, but we'll sign people up for three and then we'll... Next year, we might be having to have two slot races. Let's see how we go. Yep, sounds pretty exciting uh, to me. So look out for that on the uh, Waikato Bay of Plenty Harness Racing website at Cambridge Raceway. Right, that's the business out of the way. Yep. What, what about an acknowledgement of the staff at HRNZ and also a Christmas message from the CEO? Yeah, look, I'd like to say to everybody, all participants, all spot, everybody, no matter what you do in our sport, thanks for staying with us. Um, COVID has been a hell of a time. Um, I know myself because I've got some business interest. It has not been easy. I really feel for those that have had uh, illness, clearly, um, but those have been locked down. And those are people in Auckland, 110 days. It's a hell of a long time. I can't even do seven. Uh, I would have gone stir, stir crazy. So, look, this is our time as a nation to get out and enjoy ourselves. Still be careful because this new thing that's hit us, sitting in an MIQ just over my shoulder around the corner here, Let's hope it doesn't get out, but thanks for staying with the sport. Thanks for the enthusiasm. I've met a lot of really great people. Our problem we have with our sport is we get negative on ourselves. I'd like to think we cut that out. We use the enthusiasm of all. We've got, a, we've got one of the best sports I know for having fun with friends. And so if we can get behind that as a feeling, I think 2022, 23 will, will, will be great for us. So get out there, enjoy yourself, still worry about what, what we've got to do right, the, the masks on and the distance, and that's the way we'll get through. But have some fun and enjoy yourselves. Put the sun on the face and, and, and get back here. Back to this place, Addington Row, on a be early in February, and let's get back into it in the big time. But have a great Christmas. If you don't know how to cook a ham, come and get onto my website at, at, at HRNZ, because be, apparently I'll be telling you the next few days how to cook a ham. There you go. So a nice message there, Michael, from Gary Woodham. He's also uh, got the recipe at hrnz.co.nz on how to cook a ham for Christmas. So showing us some culinary schools there. But let's get into the race, Michael. Let's get into the details. And here they are via uh, Dave Branch and the team there at Cambridge Raceway. So 900,000, as you indicated, 2,200 metres for three-year-old and older, boys and girls. Uh, they're looking to increase the stake over the next uh, two to three years. Uh, year one, of course, uh, has been uh, 150,000, as you mentioned. 50% return minimum to the slot holders. That's if they run fifth to tenth. Gee, this is exciting. Flip the page over and uh, we'll have a look. And of course, it's a preferential barrier draw for the mares and uh, three-year-olds. So there's a real enticement there too. 
and of course uh, further details around that in the second of our slides, Michael, and we'll have a look at that now for you. Uh, that includes uh, when the details, uh, expressions of interest become open, which is on Wednesday. Uh, the full terms and conditions of the race will be sent out the 17th of January, and it all happens pretty quickly from then, Michael. It does. All right, Greg, let, let's pick it apart because there'll be people who are wondering how all this works. So there's expressions of interest and then they'll be talking to the people who express interest in buying a slot. And, and that might be most people, clearly. Most people watching this show, in fact, don't have $75,000 to blow over three years. But we'll get to that in a second. So what they'll try and do is find the best partners for the race. They'll say to people, well, OK, if you want to be part of this, can you promote it? Can you talk about it? Do you have a platform? Do you have horses who are legitimate for the race? Key factor here is it's not a slot race as in I own Krug, I'm buying a slot for Krug. Yes, you can do that. But by being over three years, Greg, it's not going to be specifically owners of horses who buy them thinking they'll race for three years because not many horses are going to do that. The idea of a slot race is that yes, some people will do that and then the next year they can sell their slot or the next year they can potentially put another horse into their slot. But a business, for example, Woodland Stud, New Zealand Bloodstock, uh, maybe another sales company, maybe another betting agency, maybe the TAB, all those type of businesses, Greg, can buy a slot. Then they can negotiate with the owners of King of Swing, Expensive Ego, copy that. Um, they can negotiate with Self Assured, the South Coast Arden team, Better Twist, maybe a Cooter. He's a three-year-old, he draw barrier one. All these things are possible. They can negotiate. The first stake is $400,000, the winning stake, and they can say, well, how much are you willing to take of that stake and vice versa for us to have your horse. So let's get this straight. It's not a sweepstake. You don't have to own a horse to buy a slot. Greg, I would consider buying a slot. Now people would say, well, why would you do that? At $75,000, $37,500 comes back to you if you finish last. I would suggest in a negotiation like that, if you're dealing with a horse who's not one of the big five, you say, well, if you run last, I get the money. You don't get anything. Again, people say you might lose $37,500, Greg. Well, to a business, as a marketing expense, which this is, that's also tax deductible. So of the $37,500 you lose, if you're getting $0.33 cents in dollar back, effectively you're losing $24,000. Again, I respect the fact most people don't have that to lose, Greg, but a lot of businesses do. And for those who are cynical and say, well, why would somebody do this? We do it every year. At the yearling sales, we go there and people pay $75,000 and a hell of a lot more, Greg, for yearlings, which don't turn out to be good sometimes and sometimes turn out to be Lazarus. So that's the dream. That's the dream they're selling here for the slot. It's for people who want excitement, want a chance to have something to hang their business on, to promote the industry, people who want to be involved, Greg. And that's effectively what racing horses is. It's wanting to be involved. And yes, these budgets aren't the budgets that lots of people deal with. But we also live in a country now, Greg, where the average yearling sales price for a colt at Karaka is over $50,000. So it's not disproportionately large. So I, I think there'll be people who want this to grow. I hope it grows. I hope next year it's a million dollars. And I hope the year after it's more. But it's a start. And this start wouldn't have happened unless first Harness Race in New Zealand came up with the concept. But then most importantly, David Branch picked it up worked extremely hard researching it and talking to code heads, including the people who ran the Phoenix last week, uh, the Greyhound Race in Australia, and made this happen. It's not going to take money out of your pocket, Gregory, or my pocket, or in fact the pocket of almost anybody watching this show. So if we can't all agree this is a good thing, if it's being funded by people who want to take that opportunity in life, and they're the same people who go to the yearling sales, and the same people who breed horses, Greg, uh, I think it's about time you got out of the game because if this yeah, is a well, good thing for you, Greg, um, you're probably not really in the right industry. Well explained. Uh, gee, there's so many permutations about who might... I had a couple of people say to me, oh, we haven't got enough horses. There's not 10 horses. But that's not the, the issue at all because the slot holder has to find a horse. And when you go through first, second and third New Zealand Cup, copy that, self-assured, South Coast Arden, then you start thinking about horses like uh, Krug, uh, who won the junior free for all? Akuta, who you mentioned, and maybe Franco Indy. Uh, Mears get a huge advantage, so better twist. 
Uh, Amazing Dream might be interested. Uh, the list goes on. Bella Montana might be interested because they're going to draw better than the boys. So I don't think it's anything to do with a lack of horses, if you like, because um, that's not the responsibility of the trainer. They'll be approached, and the owners, uh, by the slot holders. Also, Greg, I'll use myself because I can only talk about entities we can talk about. I'm not sure how somebody else would run their business. I rang Luke McCarthy today. Would you be interested with King of Swing? Love to come. Love to come. Love to come there, go to the Agua Caliente for 100, go to the Auckland Cup for 400. So then you make a deal. Now, if I buy a slot, or okay, say the box seat buys yep. a slot, and then we don't, we don't get one of those top five, they don't want to deal with us, or they've already got slots of their own, or they've got someone else, well, then I, I try and beat them. I say to the crew people, I'll give you 60% of the stake. That's the horse dealing that goes on in these things. And if I end up with a horse who maybe I don't think can win the race, maybe I end up with Cranbourne, maybe I end up with Steal the Show, okay, next year I'll go earlier. Next year, I'll, yep. I'll book my, my I'll book in next year straight away because I've got three years. I'll ring the Akuta people and say, you can have half the stake, here's my slot, and it's guaranteed 10 months out, Greg. Mm -hmm. As I said, it, harness racing has a, a, a big issue with its negativity, and this isn't going to work and that's not going to work. Well, they're not targeting people who are negative, Greg. Negative people don't buy horses at the yearling sales for 100K. Negative people don't buy slots in, in, in these races. I haven't heard anybody moan about the money they lost in their slot for the Everest publicly. We're going to roll the dice. It's going to be fun. It can't be bad because it's not your and my money. And yes, the, I would love it to be two million, Greg. How does it affect what's happening on the, on the calendar internationally? I spoke to sources in Australia today. There is high-level conversations there to have a $2 million slot race for harness racing in Australia. I believe that may be signed off very shortly. But that won't happen to 2024 if my sources are correct. That gives them two years of clear air and it sets us up for this. Sit down, this is going to get good. New Zealand Cup, potentially 600,000. Maybe it's going to be a million in a couple of years. I don't know. New Zealand Cup into the Inter Dominions, into the Hunter Cup, into four weeks later the Miracle Mile, into a couple of weeks after that the Australian slot race. I would envisage the New Zealand slot race, the race won't be mid-April forever. I think it might get closer to the 1st of May. And then we talk the Auckland Cup. Those races, those seven races, $600,000, so $600, sorry, $6 million, $6 million, Greg, at their current stake rates, if those established races don't change. They will change. We're talking about a situation in 2024, Greg, where the elite seven races in Australasia have an average stake of a million dollars, and the best horses can race for that. Now tell me, if you don't add in the Victoria Cup, the other races in New Zealand worth 100 to 200, the WA races on the Constellations in Queensland, you chuck in another couple of million. Tell me when people go to the sales at Karaka on February the 13th this year, they're not thinking to themselves, eight or nine million dollars in a season for the elite paces, that'll do me. Yeah, and exactly. Greg, that's and where the money, do trickles back to everybody in the industry, to all the breeders. It's not just about rich people, Greg. That money goes through everybody in the industry because the prize in the lottery we're buying tickets for in February just got a hell of a lot bigger. Yeah, it certainly has. Uh, so some massive news coming out of HRNZ and uh, the Waikato Bay of Plenty Harness Racing Club. Of course, we're having a month off over January. By the time we come back, about the 25th, I think it is, uh, the expressions of interest would have been in for over a week. So we'll be able to update you with that. Uh, big news. Uh, while we're on Harness Racing New Zealand, our junior driver profile, just scaling it back a little bit, but gee, she's talented, this young lady. Uh, Kieran Tomlinson is our next profile of a young person in harness racing. Well, you were always going to be part of this game, weren't you? Yeah, for sure. You know, I've grown up in the industry and um, done the kids' carts and everything. So, um, yeah, I just once you get the horse racing blood through your system, you just can't get it out. Kieran, let's talk about where it began with those kids' carts because you managed to get three New Zealand Cups on this very track at Addington Raceway and you just loved it. Oh, yeah, no, it was great. I, you know, I had some good, nice ponies in that as well, but no, it was, it was real good. Three different ponies, though. Remind me of their name. Uh, Demi, Frisbee and Boost. Yeah. 
amazing to get three wins on three different ones. And you got a couple of Australasian championships as well, didn't you? Yeah, no, they were a lot of fun. You know, met a lot of um, new people in that, and they're all driving and juniors over in Aussie and that. So it's it is really good. You know, sometimes you know you watch TV and oh, you know, you know some of them that are winning races and that. So it's really good, and a lot of them are training too now. So it's always good just to keep out an eye on them and like you know them. So it's great. First winning drive for you, Zar Zara, that was up at Nelson, a place that you and the family always head to. Yeah, yeah, no, it was real good. You know, family horse, mum owned it, granddad bred it and that, and um, yeah, she was she was just a gem to drive. You know, trot all the way, and it was. I'm pretty sure it was only like a, it wasn't a very big field, but when she just got to the top and she just kept bowling. So. Now that's a, a big win for you. But your favourite horse of all time, Mordecai. Mordecai, you know, I like to tell people he's pretty much gone 153 um, because he was sitting parked doing it. But no, he's he's my favourite horse of all time. He's got a great record at Nelson, which is my favourite track. And, you know, I learned a lot with him. He was um, my first race day drive and I went through all the trials and the cadet system and everything um, when we had to do the times and that out here um, on him. And he was, he was just so good to drive and so easy and I learnt a lot of him. Yep, you learnt a lot from that horse and now you're based down at Team Williamson working uh, for Brad. Tell me a bit about that and how much you're enjoying it. Oh yeah, I love it down there, you know, driving the trotters every single day. You know, Brad and Phil and Maddie, Nath, you know, they've been absolutely great to me, helping me as much as they can with their dri with my driving. Matt, he's my mentor, so, you know, he's always criticising me every drive. Like, I've been up in the North Island and he'll be sending me Snapchats. You know, this drive was a 8 out of 10, 5 out of 10, you know. he was He's real good and, you know, Brad, he's great because he just lets me, you know, he knows how hard it is and, you know, once... You your junior, you know, you just got to have, take every opportunity you can. So he's pushing me as much as he can. You know, you may not have the horses just yet, not like race horses just yet, but um, hopefully you'll have a few in the summer time. Yeah, he did give you a steer on Cracker Hill though, didn't he? Yeah, no, he's great. You know, I was only working there a month and he said you can drive Cracker and, you know, a lot of people probably criticised him putting me on and that, but, you know, it's great to know that he had... You know, he he believed that much in me um, to drive him, and you know, I may have gone on record, but I tell him I felt like I was only walking. You know, I turned around at the 400, and they're all you know 200 metres behind me. But no, definitely one of the best horses I've ever driven, and um, I hope he comes back even better. Oh well, you're great fun on and off the track. Congratulations on the way things are going, and uh, thanks for stopping by on the box seat. Thank you very much. So she's a delight to have around, uh, Kieran Tomlinson. Michael, she's already driven 60 winners of about a 1,000 race drives she's had so far. And uh, of the 30 winners she's had in the elongated season, over half of those trotters. So the family lineage coming through there, I think about 17 wins with the Square Gators. But um, she's doing a good, good job and, and the family uh, just continuing on their tradition of, of being involved in this great sport. Yep, bred to be good. Obviously, her sister's an outstanding driver. They both came through the pony trot system, Greg, which has been so, so important for harness racing in this country. And well done. I love having those profiles on young people because, Greg, afterwards you think you know them better. And then when they win a race, you're happier. Yep, and just back to the race. There is a market out uh, for it. Early favourite is copy that at $3.50. Uh, Self-assured, three eighty. dollars Expensive Ego's in there at about $4. Uh, South Coast Arden, four forty. dollars Krug at $6.00 and Spankham at seven fifty. dollars So uh, you can bet into that now. Of course, it doesn't include maybe some of the mares like Amazing Dream. Obviously, Akuta's not there. So once those slot uh, slots get taken up, then it'll become a little bit more clear about well done to the TAB getting a market out on that. With Garrards, we're going to go across the ditch now and catch up with what happened over the weekend. Of course, speaking of, copy that. He went around, Michael, in the Cranbourne Cup. Uh, he was parked out. Anthony Butt said, no, I'm staying in front with Amazing Dream. But he gets collared late by another expat Kiwi. He does. Um, so Supreme Dominator's coming to the outside here of Amazing Dream. It's Amazing Dream in front. Supreme Dominator, formerly trained by Barry Purden and... Maybe Scott Phelan, I'm not sure they were in partnership at that stage of this horse's career, but Supreme Dominator gets up on the line. One better's delight beats another, another former Kiwi and Rick Riley getting up for third. Now, copy that. Uh, had to sit parked for Chris Venosio. That wasn't really the reason he dropped out. Quite clearly, he wasn't at his best and he dropped out very, very badly. So way too poorly performing here to be just about the trip. 
um, Ray Green, who wasn't able to attend the races because of the three-day home isolation you have to undergo when you arrive in Australia, um, had the horse uh, veterinary examined yesterday, Greg, or Monday, so we're filming this on Tuesday. He did that, and they'll get the report back. I'll be stunned, Greg, if there wasn't a little issue somewhere. Uh, not structural. They had the horse vetted straight after the race, so it's not soreness or bone. It would suggest it's probably an infection, um, some sort of bug the horse has got. He has a fair while to the Hunter Cup. That's his main aim. That's on February the 5th, so I don't think they'll be panicking too much just yet. But as Ray said, I didn't like seeing my little horse dropping out like that, and I can't wait to get my hands back on him. Yeah, good on uh, him. I'm sure he'll iron those issues out. Uh, tenth win in Australia for Supreme Dominator. Another expat Kiwi, Have Horse Will Travel. Got it done in the Cranbourne Trotters Cup. That's Majestic Man coming wider in the Phil Williamson colours. Uh, but another that Andy and Kate Gath have uh, purchased out of New Zealand and delivering at the highest level. Originally with Darren Simpson, then Brett Mangos actually won the last race on Inter-Dominion Grand Finals night in 2019. Like a lot of Andy and Kate's horses, had gate speed. Um, we had a long conversation explaining that on Trot's Talk on ECNZ. That's on every Sunday at lunchtime if you need some more harness racing fix over the break. Um, Andy said he likes to buy horses he thinks have some speed, and this horse clearly has. He's going to be given his chances at races like the Great Southern Star and the huge amount of big racing coming up in Victoria, Greg. On Majestic Man, clearly he would look either tired or below his best after the Inter-Dominions and travel back to Victoria. So I would suggest he'll have a small freshen up. Just around him too, Greg, and that bunch of trotters. Now, obviously on Tuesday, some major news came out of New Zealand about Omicron and the home isolation for returning from Australia uh, being put back from the middle of January, Greg, to the back end of February. Now, why that's crucial, it means that a driver like John Dunn, who is looking to take Sunday Sun to Australia for the Great Southern Star, if he goes now, he won't be able to come back to the end of February. That is unlikely for someone who's such a key component to Team Dunn. He will wait until after Sunday Sun has raced at Cambridge in the first two weeks of uh, January. Then he'll make his decision, Greg, on whatever's happening with Omicron and the MIQ and home isolation. He'll make a decision on whether A, the horse goes at all, B, whether he goes with the horse, or Greg, here's C, Sunday Sun potentially goes over and joins a trainer that team done and the owner, Colin, here, trust. So Sunday Sun's trip to the Great Southern Star, Greg, by no means scarpered by the fact that the home isolation is out of play until the end of February at this stage. Just wanted to get that to punters, Greg, because there are markets open on that, and of course, everybody wants to know where the best horse in the country is going. All right, beautiful. Thanks for the update uh, there. We're about to take a short break. You need to stick with us, though. We've got to review what happened last week, and we have some Christmas crackers. Yes, the trainers and drivers from around the country have provided us with a horse for you to follow, and that's still to come on your box seat. Welcome back into your box seat. Let's go to Alexandra Park. Group one glory awaited. One of our top ladies in harness racing. On this occasion, it was better twist. And the 26th running of the Rosslyn Stud Queen of Hearts will get Aaron White to bring her home and then hear from a part owner, Ken Brecken, on what it's like to have his girl back. Trying hard, need you now. Better twist for more. Group one glory under the ribbon of light at Alexandra Park. Mango gets another queen of hearts. Second over, need you now. The honey queen for third. I know you'll love being back. Group one race winning on your home track. Michael, I love being back at the park. I mean, that's an exceptional thing, just being back at the park. But very special tonight. Um, you know, we had a tough campaign over in Australia. Um, probably a little bit unlucky, but um, look, look, she's back at the park. Brent Mangos, um, you know, has done a wonderful job, uh, you know, training her, you know, fill in for, for Mark and All Stars Stables. But um, yeah, she was exceptional tonight. 
she did get beaten in Australia, and she seems to be keen that her absolute strength is when she's against the marker pegs so she can run the speed out of the other horses. And we saw that tonight, and a, a long way from home. You must have been confident. Yeah, look, I mean, it was a strange start. I mean, we were very fortunate. Uh, she got to the front quite easy tonight. The horse inside her broke, and uh, they dawdled the first half. As Mango said, they came home in 55, and, you know, for those at the back, it doesn't matter how good you are, you're not going to pick up when they're running those sort of times. She's technically only three. I know it's four in the old, but you're going to chuck her in the deep end next time. She's going to go to the Franklin Cup, I believe, and Mark Purden may well be back here to drive her that day. Yeah, look, look, that's what we're hearing, and I hear that she's also been uh, nominated for the Auckland Cup, which, of course, will be the new season and the new date for the Auckland Cup. And that's very exciting, too, with a new stake. You know, I think it's 400000 next year, so... Um, and, and she's a great stayer. I mean, uh, that's going to be a gig in, in the next, you know, year or so. So, um, Karen and I have decided, you know, uh, with the syndicate, um, they've been great people, they've been involved, most of them, from, uh, from our first syndication, and... Uh, Albeit we normally take the horse back at the end of the four-year-old season, they're that great. I think Karen and I will just renew it and, and make sure that they can uh, have the buzz of them running in, in these great Group 1 open races. Ken, it's getting close enough, about two months out from the sales. You told me the other day sneakily, but now we're going to tell everybody, you believe you've got the best draft you've ever taken on Brick and Farms. Yeah, look, I do. Well, I mean, we had an exceptional sale last year. A credit to, uh, to Nigel Fay and the team down there. Um, and, and Philly and, and, and Phil, they've been with us a long time but Nigel Fay obviously took over the helm just a couple of years ago. What he's done with the farm, whether it be pasture uh, the maintenance but um, what he's actually done with the mares is just quite, quite exceptional and it's paying dividends. I mean these horses look exceptional, you know, albeit two months out, you know, they are really class act and the pedigrees, uh, you know, just exceptional you know, and then you look at tonight, you know, like we had... Um, um, a hot and treacherous win tonight here at the park. Great wee horse. Got a got a three quarter brother or half brother in the sales. A captain treacherous, cold out of the Outstanding individual. Party on. You know the one we had so much fun with again in the syndication. I think she won five six crude ones. Uh, she has a cold in the sales. So it's an exceptional pedigree coming through. Keenan, more importantly. Talk me through the shirt you're wearing, because we're used to Crandall Giddy producing this type of thing at Alexandra Park, but this is, is this, did Karen buy this? Was this something you did on a whim? No, listen, we, we've been down on the farm, you know, we got, we got out of lockdown, very anxious to get down to the farm. We've had uh, a rush trip down there. We're actually filming the yearlings, uh, you know, for next year and, and taking some of the new photographs, and uh, we rushed home. My young son, Andrew, we haven't seen him for three months. He arrived home, so uh, I ripped down a curtain and threw it on. I thought, that'll do, baby. Let's go. So great to get that insight from Ken Brecken. I actually rang him today, Michael, about uh, the Broadcasting Standards Authority having an issue with the shirt he had on, and he thought I could see him at the time because he said he had one similar on today. So clearly the dress uh, sense is not going that well for the Brecken family, or Ken in particular. i tell you what, he could have been wearing a sack, Greg. He would have been happy to be back at Alexandra Park. He loves the place. He was thrilled to have his horse back, to have his mates back. Uh, he had the family there. Um, they were making a bit of a ruckus. They were enjoying themselves. Themselves. It was a really good feel at Alexandra Park last Friday, which is going to get a lot better heading forward. Obviously, Auckland's still in the red setting. It'll be more fun there uh, in the orange setting for December 31, which is where she's heading, Greg. So a little bit surprised to hear she's going to the Thames Cup, but I suppose it's basically, uh, sorry, Franklin Cup. I suppose basically it's a three-year-old race because, Greg, it's going to have her, her Krug, um, hot and treacherous BD Joe, who we're going to see those shortly, Greg. So it's going to have some of the older horses, but I shouldn't be surprised a three-year-old filly's going to go in it because it's kind of got the feel, Greg, of a standing start Northern Derby. Yeah, and the race was effectively over, Michael, once Life's a Beach galloped and Brent was able just to roll to the front. 2.42 was just a walk in the park for her, but uh, you only have to go fast enough to win and she grabs another Group 1. You mentioned Hot and Treacherous. Let's go and have a look at his performance. Bred by the Breckens, of course. Uh, excellent run, stepped beautifully, got to the front and did this to them. Franco Niven comes through on the inside. BD Joe's letting down with a very good run right down the outside. Hot and Treacherous, Franco Niven the inner. Hot and Treacherous and Hot and Treacherous. He's back in the winning groove here at Alexandra Park. Second, Franco Niven, very tight for third. BD Joe all bad to the boat. Well, you thought he might step lead and win Gareth, and that's what happened. 
Yeah, it was a really, really pleasing result, Mick. Um, got away from the tapes good and got got to the front. And um, once he was there, it sort of made it a bit harder for the rest. And, and yeah, so he got home really well. He looks like he half waits for them about the 150 metre mark, and it, but he looked like he wasn't struggling. He went again once he saw them. Yeah, exactly. And um, pretty much Max said very similar as well. And w once they got a bit closer, he went again. And, yeah, so... Very happy. I take it you're off to the Franklin Cup because he looks, Gareth, like he's even stronger than the first half of the season when he was three for the first time. <laughs> yeah, def definitely he's come back stronger again um, and pressing on with, yeah, uh, Franklin Cup's the, the aim next and then where to after that, maybe the mile in February here on that uh, Millions night, but we'll just play that by ear. These days, how many horses are you and your dad training? Because you've had three good horses racing tonight and they've all gone good and black type races. Yeah, we're, we're doing 12 at the moment. We've got a lot of young ones um, coming through in and out. And um, these three uh, that raced tonight and we had another one that raced last night, they're all nice enough type. So it's nice coming to the races with a team like that. You guys have had serious open class horses like the Orange Agent in recent years. The two horses who raced in, in, in the big races tonight, um, obviously Hot and Treacherous and the Honey Queen, do they give you open class horse feels, Gareth? Yeah, definitely. Like, um, Captain with his manners and everything like that, um, he's from the stand and that, like, he I think he'll definitely be a nice cup horse come cup time next year. Uh, and Honey... It's in the similar mould, you know. Um, she hasn't had too many standing starts yet, but um, she's had a couple at the trials and gone away from them all right. So um, once she comes to that, we'll, we'll find out when it comes race night. So, mate, during our interview there, Zach Butcher ran past and slapped you on the arse. Do we, A, go to the stewards and tell them he's harassing you, or B, should we go beat him up? I think we should go beat him up. <laughs> Yes, that's Zachary Butcher, up to no good as per normal. Michael, can you confirm nor deny what happened post that? Um, look, we thought about it, but Gareth was busy and I'm not strong enough or I'm too old, Greg, to be trying to beat anybody up. And, and we don't condone violence here on the box seat. But I will <laughs> tell the viewers at home one little secret of the, uh, the stabling area at Alexandra Park. If you are doing an interview... Uh, if someone's going to be annoying and tickle someone with the whip, <laughs> usually between the legs or sometimes on the butt or hit them in the back of the head, there is about a 79% chance it'll be one of the butchers. Yep. They are all villains when it comes to interrupting interviews. Uh, pesky people, Greg, and yeah, the sooner they close the borders back again and put all the butchers back down to Waikato, the better. <laughs> he's done a great job, this hot and treacherous. That took his uh, earnings over 100000 Michael, and he's got a big part to play in any race he lines up in. I think Ricky's typical of a lot of horses who are naturally good and they start racing and they win a couple of races and then they go to the sire stakes and they get beat and you go, well, they're not as good as I thought they were. And then they take that on board. This time last year, his form was getting poorish because he was racing in good races. Then he went back to places like Cambridge, got his confidence back, strength and got better. And he's obviously an open class horse in the making, Greg. Standing start man has helped. But we see it so often with those three-year-olds. They go there, it's really tough for them because those more developed horses are better. And then when they come back, they're stronger and fitter. Um, he's in that, that bunch of horses now. And we saw it on Jules Day because he was so good in the Jules that you know, we have him, we have crew, we have BD Joe, who was really good there. Um, we have all these horses who are coming through and they're going to use that Franklin Cup, Greg. Then they turn four the next day and it's game on for a whole bunch of good four-year-old races on both sides of the Tasman, and potentially for a horse like him, Greg, who's to say someone's not going to pick him for this slot in the race? Yeah, it could be in the race. Yeah, I really like the way BD Joe found the line there uh, with a view going forward. Uh, Speaking of going forward, Remember Me was having her second run at Alexandra Park. This is her in front. Stable mate first rows to her outside, Michael. Uh, look, the overall time was 2.06. Slipped home in 27.8. Spoke to Blair Orange uh, post-race. He said she felt really strong. Uh, handled the Alexandra Park way of going nicely. This was... The 50th training win for Chrissy Delgetti, who of course kicked off with Nathan Purden and now training with her husband, Cran. Well, uh, congratulations to you, Chrissy. Um, the family have got a lot of wins next to their name if you add in her brothers and, and Cran. Good filly, this. Second filly's really good too. Like a lot about this field, Greg. 
just that's a good bunch. We love it. And as you can see there, Chrissy, very popular on social what media. What about Cran's so. message there? Gee whiz, I would love to get her phone number. Yeah. Well, mm. look, the, as, as we've seen in harness racing today, there's some really good developments, and there's also some very, very silly people. Ken Brickin, <laughs> um, Zach Butcher, Cran, Cran Dalbetti. It's, it's remarkable the industry is still going. Good. It really, <laughs> really is. It, it is. Uh, the market for the size stakes remains true fantasy. $1.65 is very short. Uh, you can get, of course, uh, $3.80 for the winner there, remember me, and about $6 for first you, rows. You think she can win, don't you? You, you think oh, remember I, me absolutely. can beat true fantasy? Yep. You think she beats? Who's better who are true fantasy? Well, true fantasy's probably got the runs on the board, but I, I reckon potentially... I think, remember me, she's got the right breeding to go an awfully long way. Really good crop of fillies, though, Michael. That's going to be, ah, well, it's the last race, last group, one of the race of the of the year, but it's, gee, it's going to be one heck of a contest. Can't wait for that one. Uh, Temporale just keeps on winning. Another stunning performance from uh, him. He made it win number 25 in his career. He's earned nearly 700,000, and he just did what Temporale does, Michael. He's a different type of horse to the horse I'm about to mention, but he reminds me of this horse because he's so durable, he has extremely high gate speed, and there's a good chance he will just race forever, Greg. And that's Idle Scott. Idle Scott raced around the 90s. He won 44 races, Idle Scott. This is Temporale's 25th, so he's not going to get to 44. But they have that ability to run hard early to put their rivals under pressure, and Greg, that's half the battle. Half the battle these days is getting against the marker pegs. And in the second part of Idle Scott's career, he wasn't good enough to beat the best horses. And I don't think Temporale is very often good enough to beat them. He did beat Bolt for Brilliance once last year. But when there's no BFB, uh, Greg, and no Sunday Sun, and Muscle Mountain, of course, he's going to be too good for the rest of them most weeks, Greg. He was off 20 metres there, and he just did it like it was track work. And to be honest, Greg, for him, it probably feels like it was. Yep, he's a remarkable horse, that's for sure. Won a row cup, of course, as a four-year-old. Let's go to Mr Ibiza, winning for the wizard Todd Mitchell. We'll get some post-race comments from him as well. Just the second career win in the lather up at Woodlands. Great to have Woodlands support of the box seat. And Mr Ibiza bolted him. Welcome back to the park, the wizard. Here he is at his brilliant best. Mr. Ibiza gets the win. Photo second, flying Tommy Casino action. Close up with those mates. Pretty nice performance tonight, Todd, because that was a good field. It was a good field, and like you know, I would have been happy if he sort of come away running in the first four or five. Um, the more I looked at the field, the more depth there was to it. So I was pretty happy with tonight's run. He's a hard horse to work out because he got beaten in not a strong field last time at Cambridge, but he seems to be very, very quick when he gets things his own way. Yeah, well, he's had the first couple of runs in those side stakes heats. I never trolled him and um, just worked him at home, and I thought it'd take a little bit of improvement. So when we decided not to go to Christchurch for the side stakes, we will give him a little bit of a freshen up and then went into that Cambridge race without going to the workouts, and I just think I might have had him a little bit underdone. I didn't really want to get into a war early with Dylan. Um, with his filly, so I just sort of let him go. But um, I thought that that run at Cambridge tightened him up a little bit, and um, we sort of thought we'd run out of the gate tonight. And it was, you know, made it a bit easier when that favourite Gallop made a mistake. But um, like he still did a little bit of work early and, and kicked home. So you know, it's nice to have a nice one in the barn again. It's a great story how you got the horse. You you took him to look after him for the jewels for Murray Notman. And he said you might as well keep him. Well, yeah, the, like it was a bit out of the blue. Murray said you might as well keep him in your place and race him. And everyone's saying, well, how long's he at your place for? And I said, well, I suppose as long until Murray gets sick of me. I suppose. <laughs> when you see those horses who aren't overly big, Todd, you wonder how far they can go. But he can run the sort of sectionals I would suggest to go most of the way to open class. Well, I know, um, like Logan always had a high opinion of him as a younger horse and he, he had a big season early in the two-year-old season um, so you know Logan's always thought he's a derby type horse so mm -hmm. hey I hope he's right but um, he's always one of those horses you could race as a two and three-year-old a couple of nice seasons and then um, flick overseas if you wanted to but he's a lovely gated horse and he seems to have his manners so um, just fingers crossed we can carry on. What about recently uh, your old friend Greg O'Connor was waxing lyrical about Mark Jones training a galloping winner and a harness racing winner on the same weekend. You've done the same thing in two weeks. No mention. Greg O'Connor's got no love for you. It's, it's embarrassing, Todd, how it's come to, isn't it? No mention. And then and it even came up on my Facebook page a memory about eight years ago, Mick, trained and drove in the same day. 
but still disappointing, Todd. Still no mention from Greg. But I think this might be the first time I've been on the box seat since he's actually taken it over. Well, it's only because I'm here, Toddy. Yeah, thanks, mate. <laughs> and it will be the last time that Todd Mitchell appears on the show for a wee while. Michael, he doesn't deserve it after slaying me there, mate, to be fair. Look, it's not a hatred towards you up here in Auckland, but there's a lot of anger, a lot of anger, Greg. <laughs> a lot of people who used to be your friends are, are not feeling the love now. But look, it, it's cool. We've all got to make our decisions in life, Gregory. And um, Yeah, fair to say I, I wouldn't bother coming up for the 31st, brother. All right, let's leave that there and uh, head to the grass track on Sunday. Great to see a big crowd there too. And uh, Derek and Adele Jones, they've had a run of it uh, recently. They won with Lulu Le Mans, the Akaroa Cup, and a Kiss the Girls. Uh, Storm's home here for uh, Robbie Close. That's her getting to the middle of the track and bang. Picks up win number five uh, by Terra to Love. And right on the post, uh, scores victory there uh, in the Rangiora Summer Cup. Up. So uh, congratulations uh, to the Joneses, uh, grabbing another one of those, and I'm pretty sure they won't be finished with those uh, two horses. Uh, nice performance from Kiss the Girls uh, winning the Summer Cup in front of a big crowd there. Speaking of uh, milestones, well, James Francis Curtin picked up win number 300 in his career, as we see Robbie Close salute like he has been a lot uh, recently. Uh, he did it with Star Casino at Addington Raceway, so congratulations to you, Jimmy. Started off with Giovanna back in 1985, driven by Mark Nose Fuller. Uh, Giovanna was the first win for Jim Curtin, and he has grabbed the 300. And there's Derek Jones uh, congratulating uh, Robbie after that win. We've got to take a short break here on your box seat. On the other side, we'll preview some of the feature racing coming up around uh, Christmas and give you those Christmas crackers. Welcome back into your box seat, uh, brought to you by our stable of sponsors, of course. Let's get straight into the hits and misses from uh, last week uh, with our friends from the TAB. A couple of thousand there on uh, Raka Stella at $2.50. Uh, Nicholas Cage, that should be, at uh, $10,000 at $1.20. No fear there, although it was a pretty tight finish in the end. Better Twist was well back, $2.70 into $2.20, and someone had 5 k on there, and also 5 k on Remember Me. And you can see those that missed, including True Fantasy, who was uh, in behind Laver at the $4 quote, finishing in second position. So that's the TAB hits and misses from last week. And a big thank you to Matt Peden for giving us that information once again. Let's have a look at the map coming up because there's so much harness racing for you. Ashburton, it's Cup Day there on Thursday, $25,000. First of 10 goes at 11 minutes past 12. Deep race, that is. Winton, uh, they race on Friday, 12.07 is the start time there. They'll be on the meeting code of 7 and they've got 10 races. Cambridge, uh, 11.57, the traditional Christmas Eve and the Christmas Cup is the final race on the programme. $20,000 they race for there. Westport, they race for the same. Uh, 11 42 They've ended up with 10 races, I think, uh, and the fields have only just come out for those. Uh, and Gore have a pretty good uh, race day on Monday, 12.33, the start time there, including the pacing and trotting cups there on the meeting code of 7-2. And then, of course, uh, Westport, they race there two days, the 11 races there, 12 o'clock the start time there on the Tuesday. And Carrara, their cup, uh, the big fields and a huge crowd there on Wednesday, 12.22 will be the start time there. Gee, there's some race meetings on. Cambridge race again on the Wednesday too, uh, eight minutes past four with the 10 races. Thank you to Cameron J. Shaw, who's provided us with the map once again. Let's get into the preview, though, and kick things off with the Ashburton Cup. And uh, this is with uh, Rakaia uh, Seed Cleaning. Here is uh, Laver in front, uh, one of two wins on the day for Carter Del Getty. A big day uh, for him, driving a winner for his grandfather, Jim, of course. Uh, but Laver was too strong, goes round in the cup. It's race number eight. Uh, that's true fantasy in second, so beating a good field. It's a deep, deep race there. 
uh, at Ashburton on Thursday. He was too strong. Uh, he takes on a good field above and beyond. Pace and Pride, Cranbourne, Classy Brigade, they're all there. So uh, a very good addition it will be for the Ashburton Cup. Here's Phoebe Onyx winning uh, at Addington Raceway. Uh, comes down the centre of the track in the hands of uh, Colin De Filippi. Uh, looks hard to beat again, goes round in uh, race number four, racing really well since being trained on the beach. Bob Butt with a couple in it, Gold Chain being uh, the other, and she was excellent first up, so she'll be pretty hard to beat in that. But Phoebe Onyx uh, made it win number seven from start 61, a pretty prolific uh, uh, performer out of the coast of Howe Barn, and now, of course, uh, with Bob Butt. So a good race, that one. Uh, the feature trot, which is the Bill Doyle Memorial, uh, we then need to go to uh, Cambridge Raceway, and this is on Christmas Eve, of course. Michael, talk me through this. Uh, Tango in heaven gets beaten. That's him outside the leader, but he was pretty brave. Yeah, first run back, had a difficult Bowery draw, beaten by horses who are fitter. Greg, it's a step up when he's in the, the last race, the last of, of an earlier start to the meeting. Usually Christmas Eve is uh, a, a twilight meeting at Cambridge. It's actually a day meeting. So it's at 4.30. He's off 20 metres, off a handicap, but he's up against some pretty decent horses in Kango and Taipo. So a lot's going to depend here, Greg, for all three of them, how hard they run early. If they run really hard, it's going to be difficult for those back markers, but he might be fitter than them. Stablemate's Bohemian Rhapsody. She's in a three-year-old trotting fillies race. Don't have many of those. It's a more or less a, more, a mini Waikato Oaks type race. She led here, sort of half-weighted for the other horse, or might have just been getting a touch tired. Um, good type of horse, naturally speedy horse, will come off the mobile nice and hard. Thought the horse for her to beat um, was Cyclone Lucky Linda, who's a pretty nice type of horse. So like both of them, Cyclone Lucky Linda, probably not much inferior to Bohemian Rhapsody. The early movement in that race, Greg, could be crucial to the outcome. All right, let's have a look at uh, the Pulse Energy Westport Cup. And here's a horse that was very unlucky two starts back. Uh, last of the Mohican starts off the 10 metres in that cup. Uh, in the Lawrence Hanrahan colours, runs right up the back of them and did the same at his next start. Uh, but have a look at him here, running to the line. That's Pace and Pride uh, in front. Gee, last of the Mohicans will be hard to beat in the cup there at uh, Westport. And all the very best to the Coast Clubs. Westport, and of course, Reefton, who race on the third. Always a great carnival, so uh, looking forward to that. The 10 races, they kick things off there on Boxing Day at 12 minutes past 12 o'clock. OK, Rakiro Racing, best bets of the week. Michael, last week we grabbed a double. Your odds uh, were around 450 mine about $2, so a nice old double. Hasn't happened that often here on the box seat. No, we've had a bad start to the tipping um, season, Greg. It's been poor. Uh, but that's okay, we're going to kick on now, there's a bit of momentum coming up. Um, I thought Cambridge had some really interesting races coming up on, on Friday, so I was keen to get involved there. So he went to Alexander Park in an easier race, it'll be a leg at pick six, um, he should just lead and win. So to be honest, for the Dale Giddy team, I think they've snuck him down there, Greg, for a nice cheeky little easy win, and that should be cheeky and easy. All right, I've gone with Harania, race eight, number three at uh, Winton. Should be extremely hard from a handy barrier draw. And Jason Broad, who's batting at two from two so far, went with Glorophilia on the same day in race number two. We've grabbed these for you, the Christmas Crackers. So here's a list of uh, horses you need to follow over the Christmas racing period, some of them racing on Thursday and Friday. Tony Hulahi with Melanion, uh, Barry Purden with uh, Artisan, uh, and further down, you've got the likes of Scott Phelan with uh, Major Perry and Todd Mitchell with the Fishermen. So that's a look uh, at the Northern. You might want to take a photo on your phone. I'm going to send these through to Harness Race in New Zealand so uh, they might put them on the website too for you. Steve Telfer with Where's the Gold. Here's uh, a heap from the South. Hayden Cullen with uh, Oneedon Mickey. Blair Orange with Azora High. It's starting at Ashburton so you get right into it very, very quickly. Tony Barron's got a nice filly in Glory's uh, Delight who was second at Addington on debut. Kofi Blaze there for Mark Jones. The page will flip over shortly because there's a whole lot more coming your way. Robbie Close and Regan Todd both went for Fernley Blackbird. Look out for it to continue on its winning way. Bob Butt was first to come through with himself. It's also at Ashburton. And you've even got some of the dates that the horses will be lining up. Ben Hope has his first uh, trained horse, the one that's uh, going to be in his new colours. Tedesco going around at the Rungiora meeting 
on the 1st. So uh, that's all the information you need. The Christmas crack is there, Michael, for people to get involved in. And on behalf of both of us, I'm sure I speak for you, uh, to our sponsors who make the show possible. We wish you and your families a uh, very Merry Christmas. And everyone who's contributed to the show, from Emily Morgan, who does the camera work here, Nigel and the team up at uh, Alexandra Park, and, and to you, Michael and Amanda, I wish you all the very best for Christmas as well. Thank you, brother. Have a good one. And what a great Christmas present for our industry. A new $900,000 race, which Greg's going to become a million dollar race. That'll right. do me Glenn nicely. Bourne, who puts this together for us each and every uh, week too. We wish you and the family all the very best. From us, though, we'll see you in a week's time where we'll preview the New Year's Eve meeting at Alexandra Park.